Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good morning, everyone. It is Friday, August the 26th, 2022. It is currently 1157 a.m. Central Time, and I'm coming to you live from the Theology Central Studios located right here in Abilene, Texas. Have a question for you. I think you kind of know that by now, right? Whenever I turn on the microphone, I always have a question for you. I don't always have answers, but I do like to ask lots and lots of questions because I think if I ask you a question, the goal is hopefully to get you engaged, not only in what I'm saying, but maybe engaged in, well, conversation so that you email me your thoughts and perspective, which in many cases just leads to another episode. And I just think it continues the conversation and it makes it better for everyone. But it's just my way of approaching things. I love to ask questions. I do this in all of my teaching. I very much like asking. And the Socratic method, I like asking questions, asking questions. But I like asking questions. I like throwing out ideas and theories usually with a goal to lead you to a certain direction, but I just like that process. I like that because sometimes an answer will make me then rethink the direction I'm trying to take you and then to say, you know what? We've got to change everything. My 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 conclusion is wrong because of your answer. So I, I, I enjoy that. I don't know if you do, but I, I know sometimes I feel like, man, I always start the podcast with asking a question. Should I feel bad about that? Then I'm like, you know, actually I don't because that's kind of the way I want to do so. So you you can tell me whether you like it or don't, but here we go. Do you have certain words that are used within Christianity, certain phrases that are used within Christianity all the time that really bother you? They really bug you. They really frustrate you. They really irritate you. Do you just have that, oh, no, oh, no, that, that buzzword? Like, like, okay, let's just remove Christianity. Let's forget, let's forget Christianity. Let's forget the church for a moment. But even in, at work, the, the, I, depending on your place of work, there may be certain phrases or words that are used that just drives you crazy, like, think outside the box. Oh, man, stop saying that, right? You know, just, just what's your, our purpose statement? What's our mission statement? Even in the workforce, oh, oh, there's just so many different phrases. I mean, I could, I could go through different things said when I was in the medical world, but you, you probably know of phrases that you can't stand in your job. But when it comes to Christianity, when it comes to the church, when it comes to your church, when it comes to your Christian friends, when it comes to Christianity, are there certain phrases that just as soon as someone says them, you're just like, oh, stop, stop. I don't ever want to hear the phrase again. Please stop talking. Do, 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 do you have some? Do you, I, I have I have many. Now, maybe, maybe, and I'm willing to admit this, maybe the problem isn't with the phrase. Maybe the problem isn't even with the concept. Maybe the problem is with me. And I am more than willing to acknowledge that. But I this is confession time, all right? So I'm I have to confess. It's, it's been a while since my last confession, but I have to confess that I loathe, I despise, I cannot stand, I hate, I don't, uh, I'm trying to find uh, new words. I, I mean, you don't even understand. It almost in, induces rage and anger when I hear the word fellowship, oh. Man, I just, my head just explodes. And community, fellowship and community. Like, I can't even say it. No, I can't just say fellowship and community. I have to say fellowship and community. Oh, man, those words. I want to just start throwing things across. I just, I literally, I just, I like, I like, I, no, no, no. It's like, I hear the word fellowship and community. And I'm like, that's it. I'm getting in my car and I'm going to go drive it a hundred miles an hour into a tree because I cannot stand those words. And I'm not, I know some of you are like, oh, he doesn't like fellowship. He doesn't like community. What is wrong with him? I, I understand that. 
I understand that that my perspective is so offensive to many Christians, but I'm going to tell you that so much of what we call fellowship and community is nothing more than a myth. It's an illusion. It's a figment of your imagination. It, it's, it's a mirage. It's not really there. It's a lie. It's something you tell yourself. There isn't fellowship. There isn't community. It's a facade. It's pretend. It's dress up. It's like kids, you know, playing grown up. It's kids playing dress up. Well, I know, I know that's going to be offensive, but I am so sick of hearing it, right? Like if, if I was looking for a church and we community and I saw something about community, I'd be like, oh, never mind. I, I don't, I don't want anything to do with it because I'm so tired of those words. Is like, why is it that within Christianity, certain buzzwords arise and everyone's like, a memo goes out. Listen, everyone use this language on your church websites. Everyone use it. Pastor, say this in the pulpit. And I'm like, I can't stay. Send me the memo and I'm going to burn the memo. Now, I know that's probably because of my more of a rebellious nature, but I just can't stand why we have to try to act. Oh, it just drives me crazy. Like, like, no, there shouldn't be a template that we all have to follow. Like, go through the assembly line. This is how you talk. This is how you dress. No, no, no. This is what you say. No. And here's my reason for despising both words. First, fellowship. Oh, man. They're, they're, Christians Christians are absolutely sometimes, I hate to say it, I think maybe we have mental disorders. I think sometimes we are so broken that we cannot see the truth. If you listen to the last live broadcast, we just talked about Christianity and reality. I think nothing more demonstrates the lack of understanding than the word fellowship. And here's the reason why. You take a group of lost people. It's a Friday night, right? Like, okay, like it's Friday. So tonight you take a group of lost people and they all come over to someone's house. They have food, right? Maybe they watch something on television. Maybe they're outside. They fire up the grill. Maybe they have a pool and they go, swim, whatever. They all hang out. Now they don't walk away and go, that was a good time of fellowship, brother. That was a good time of fellowship, sister. No, they were just getting together and hanging out and eating food. Christians get together to hang out. They don't do anything really of any greater spiritual value than what those people were doing. Maybe they drink less. Maybe they cuss less. Maybe they have better choices in what they watch or listen to. But they hang out, shove food down their throats, tell jokes, talk about their job, talk about their kids, talk about the weather, talk about nine million other just basically meaningless things. But when they leave, oh, that was a sweet time of fellowship. And at the beginning, Lord, bless this time of fellowship as we shove food down our throats and talk about nothing. It's fellowship. No, you're hanging out just like lost people do. There's nothing spiritual going on here. It drives me crazy. Christians get together to, to they can go to a, a restaurant to eat a hamburger. F bless this fellowship. We're just having a hamburger talking about nothing. Now, that, 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 I don't know how, why we call that fellowship. Fellowship. Well, like, I don't understand. Now, it may meet the technical definition. In fact, the technical definition. Let me look here. I didn't even think about having the definitions brought up. Um, but it's the way Christians, oh, okay, it's just, okay, hang on. Fellowship. Yeah, I'm going to keep saying it in the most... <laughs> in the most derogatory way possible, because I can't stand the word. Fellowship, friendly association, especially people who share one's interest, all right? So it, it may meet that generic definition, but here's the difference. The world rarely uses it. Oh, you know, okay, guys, we're here for a time of fellowship. No, Christians use it, and we know why Christians use it, because it adds a a, a I hate to say it. It's like we, it, it adds a little veneer of spirituality. See, we're not just hanging out. We're having fellowship. See, we're doing something spiritual. There's something spiritual. When we, when we cancel the preaching to go down to the fellowship hall to shove food down our throats, 
We're doing something spiritual. See, those lost people who are at Chili's tonight, they're not doing something fellow. But we're in the fellowship hall at the church shoving food down our throat. We're doing something spiritual. See, to me, it's almost like a, it's like a disguise. It's a robe of self-righteousness. When lost people hang out, they're just hanging out. But when Christians get together, it's fellowship. It's just so fake. It's so self-righteous that I cannot stand the term. I would rather like, hey, tonight after church, we're getting together to eat some food and just hang out. Join us if you want. But no, we'll say, it's going to be a time of sweet fellowship. Yeah, yeah, it's just like, oh, just stop it. Come on, man. You just want to hang out and eat. It's okay to admit that. Well, you got to make it sound spiritual. It's so fake. It's so fraudulent. It's so, you can see right through it. It's called dress up. Like, I, 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 I don't know if I can be in this fellowship because all I see is fig leaves everywhere because we put on our little fig leaves to go, look at us. We're spiritual. We're having food. It oh, drives me crazy. All right. So there's the fellowship thing. All right. And in many cases, in many cases, the idea of fellowship is you have something in common, right? You're, you have something in common. To me, Christian fellowship only occurs in any meaningful way. Now, in any meaningful way, when we fellowship around the preaching of God's word, when we fellowship in prayer because we are praying to God, we're joined in prayer we're joined together to bring our intercession and petitions and praise, thanksgiving, and confessions to God. We are joined together through the preaching of God's word. That's fellow. The sweet fellowship happens while we're joined together with open Bibles. We have something in common. We have open Bibles. We're listening to the word of God. When we join together in song, we have something in common. We're singing the same song. Or if we confess one of the creeds, we have something in common, a, a, a common belief. What are, whenever we're doing things in a congregational setting, right, where we are preaching, teaching, praying, praising, partaking of the Lord's Supper, well, any, that is fellowship. To me, a spiritual fellowship. That, but what we tend to do is we use the word fellowship typically when we're just engaged in the most fleshly, base, normal kind of activity that lost people do. But we want to make it sound spiritual. I can't. I, t- I believe the term has been so misused and abused that it's lost any significance or meaning, and it's now just meaningless words that we say, and nobody even cares what it what it means. Because I, I guess, and my problem with this started off as a young Christian when I was like told, you got to go to the fellowships. You got, and I'm like, why? Why do I have to go to the fellowships? Why? Why? Why is my Christianity called into question if I don't go? Well, you you should want to be around other believers who don't talk about anything related to God. All they want to talk about is the weather, their job, their grandkids, their dog, their back pain. I mean, wh- why? Why? I, I don't have anything in common with that. Now, you may say, well, you've, you've got a problem. I'm willing to admit it. Maybe it's because I'm very much an introvert, not an extrovert. Maybe, maybe because I would rather in many cases be by myself than with a bunch of people. But it just seems so like, okay, there I am. Okay, oh, 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 we're going to have fellowship. Okay, so what do you want to talk about? Okay, I can talk about music. Oh, don't want to talk about, I can talk about, you don't want to talk about that. I can, uh, okay, so what are we going to do? And it's almost usually the most base, mundane, Blah, 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 thing. And I know you say I shouldn't be that way, but I'm just saying, I don't just see that as fellowship. I just see it as nothing more than what lost people do. Get together, hang out, and talk about whatever. Fellowship occurs when we're in the church, around God's word, around prayer. That's fellowship. See, if we use the term for that, I would, I would be, but it's been, it's been ripped from that context and applied to everything we do. So I don't like the word fellowship. Oh, now here comes the word community. Oh boy, community. Let's look up the definition of community. I don't even know the technical definition of community because I'm so tired of the word. Let's look up the word community definition. Community is a group of people living in the same place are having a particular characteristic in common. 
It can be a feeling of fellowship with others as a result of sharing common attitudes, interests, and goals. Now, usually when it's used within Christianity, community, 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 it's used to refer to small groups. That's where we're in community. You need to be in community. You need to be. So like if you're in the congregation, it's almost viewed that that's not the community, but you need to have the small groups where you can be in community because, and you will hear this preached a lot. You cannot grow in your Christian life without community. There can be no spiritual growth. You will be vulnerable to spiritual attack. You will fall. You will, we need to be in community. If you're in community, then I, I, then all of a sudden, dun, 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 you become super Christian. But I've seen plenty of Christians in community seem to have the same problems as those who are not in a Christian community. But I don't know. I digress. But community, 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 community. So fellowship, fellowship, fellowship. You need to go to the fellowships. You got to go to the, you know, ice cream social, the church picnic, the church hayride, whatever the church is doing. That's fellowship. It's always these other just activities. Okay. And then you have to be in community. You've got to be. I long for community. I hear Christians say, I long for true community. And I was like, what in the world are you talking about? So what exactly did, and when you try to get them to explain it, sometimes I'm like, so what do you, what exactly do you want? What you said, church isn't community enough. Like what, what, what do you want? Right. And it's sometimes this vague thing. I will argue that if we define community as coming together, coming together. So I don't think community only happens when we come together and we have something in common right? We have something in common. Once again, I think then community takes place inside the sanctuary where the word of God is being preached, where we're singing together, preaching, ordinances, praying. There is community. There is community. But how is this, how essential is that community to one's spiritual growth? Now, we've almost elevated the concept of community within the church almost to the place of idolatry in my mind. It's like, man, like you can't, you can't do anything without community. Now I, I, once again, I'm just going to have to, I just have to mention this because I talk about this all the time. With, at the most vulnerable time of my Christian life, the very most vulnerable time, right? Where I was a brand new Christian. I had a million issues going on, all kinds of craziness going on in my child, my home life. I mean, I was in a vulnerable place spiritually. And guess where I grew spiritually? For the most part, had nothing nothing that happened inside the church. Nothing. It wasn't the youth group. That was a joke beyond all comprehension. It wasn't anything in the church. If I would have never attended church, right? If I would have became a Christian and did exactly what I did minus church, my Christianity would have been literally no different. The church had little to zero impact on my Christian life. I know you're going to be like, that's great. And in fact, I will argue that many of my, my great bitterness and some frustrations I had was because of the church. The church, I'll, I'll give you an example. So this is a great example. All right. So, um, it's uh, Friday afternoon. Okay, so I, I'm getting ready to, oh, I, I guess it was me, it was me and someone else. We were doing things like trying to cut the grass for the church and doing different things. I think we were earning a little bit of money. I can't remember exactly how all of the, what the agreement was, but I just know this. It was a Friday. It was an October day. I'm in high school. I get called to the principal's office and told you need to get to, back to Abilene, Texas, which is about 20, 25 minutes away, and you need to get to Hendricks Hospital as soon as possible It's your mother. And I wasn't living at my home at this time because, well, guess what? My life was literally falling apart, and there was all kinds of craziness going on. So my mom, not even 40, I get to the hospital. For all practical purposes, she's dead. I, unexpected. Out of the blue, aneurysm, gone, basically. I mean, I mean, it was going to take like 72 hours for them to be able to, to legally declare her dead because they're going to have to run brain scans and all these other things. I won't go through the whole, boring, the whole boring detail. Boring for you, obviously traumatic for me, but you get the idea. All right, so 
It's, I just get this news. Now, immediately people start finding out that, oh, this is a horrible tragedy. This is a horrible, you know, this, this is horrible. People start finding out. Well, guess what? I get back and I get a phone call. <laughs> Why haven't you cut the grass for the church? My mom? Yeah, I'm sorry about that. But you, the grass for the church needs to be cut. What? But my mom is dead. No, you need to cut the grass for the church. Yeah, I won't even go through the rest of that. Yeah, that that's some pretty messed up stuff. The, that, the church did not help me there. I've told before, my, my spiritual growth occurred sitting in my room with a notebook, three notebooks, a Bible, and a, and a radio, listening to Christian radio. That's where I grew. So uh, most of my spiritual growth did not happen inside the church. It happened, uh, and I could give you other stories of things that happened in, in my church life that were absolutely counterproductive to my Christian life, actually destructive, actually hurtful, actually not helpful in any way. So why would I call that community? Now, some would say, but that's a part of being in community is you're going to get hurt and you're going to, okay, you can say that, but I will, I will argue that uh, even if you say there was nothing, not, that not one bad thing ever happened, I don't feel that there was much there of great significance. I felt most of the time I was spiritually starving. Now, I will argue that when I finally found the, the independent Baptist church I went to in Nebraska, I think that preaching was pretty, pretty, I, I disagreed with some of its theological direction since I was moving in a reform direction and clearly they weren't, but at least they taught the word of God and I thought there was some spiritual significance there. So there was some growth from that, but even then, most of my growth was happening again outside of the church. Community, fellowship, community, fellowship, community. And we're just, it's like, if you're not in community, you can't grow. Well, the reason I'm mentioning these two things is I don't know if you realize this. If you're familiar with the podcast that was super, 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 super popular, The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill, right? Everybody remember that podcast? Well, they just dropped a new episode a couple, just a couple hours ago. It's not even available on some of the podcasting apps. It's how new it is. But I, my, I, I, I use like 15 different podcast apps that all subscribe to the same podcast. So uh, if one doesn't get it, the other one does. So I, I got it and I started listening. And immediately they, at some point they mentioned community. But they mention a, a number of other things. Now, you may get caught up into the whole concept about they're going to mention Mark Driscoll and Mars Hill. You may... I just want you to ignore all of that. You can go listen to The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill, the newest episode. But I just want to use it because I want to just kind of wrap up my discussion about these words, community and fellowship, and how I just think that they've, they, they I don't know what, I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. That's all I can say. I don't know what happened. Here we go. You'll, you'll, I'll be able to walk you through this and it will make a little bit more sense. Here we go. We arrived in Seattle, June of 1998. This is Dan Allender. Dr. Allender is a widely known and respected Christian therapist with expertise in issues like trauma and abuse. He's also the author and co-author of a number of books on healing, marriage, intimacy, spiritual formation, and leadership. A number of us left a school in Colorado and had the opportunity to start Western Seminary in Seattle. And that beginning point was a great privilege, but also an entry into a world that we were much unfamiliar with. As you might have already guessed, being in Seattle meant being in proximity to Mars Hill Church. The school he started was actually called Mars Hill Graduate School, a name that led to no small amount of confusion over the years, given the different values of their organizations. They eventually changed their name in 2011. So their paths intersected quite a few times, starting when he first came to the city and off and on in the years that followed. Perhaps their most notable intersection, though, was in late 2013 when plagiarism was exposed in Driscoll's books. In several instances, the author he plagiarized was Dan Allender. 
Okay, so we got this intersection, this interaction between a seminary and, Mar- and Mars Hill. And so there's similar names. They changed the names. But when Mark Driscoll gets exposed for plagiarism, one of the people he plagiarized was this gentleman. Now, that's the part everyone will talk about. We could go back to the whole plagiarism scandal. Still just, well, I have all kinds of thoughts about the plagiarism scandal that to this day just kind of blows my mind. It's so interesting. You can plagiarize, get busted for it, and that what, and basically the church doesn't care. Other sins, then it's the end of, and you should be crucified and you should never speak again and you should die. It's just really weird how, it, it, yeah, we, we, could, we could have all kinds of discussions about it. But all right, so there's the plagiarism. I don't want to focus on that, right? Just listen for the words. I don't think they use the word fellowship, but listen for the word community. But I think inadvertently, they demonstrate that so much of what we call community, it's a facade. It's fraudulent. Just just see if you can hear it. From Christianity Today, you're listening to a bonus episode of The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. I'm Mike Cosper, and today I'm talking to Dr. Dan Allender about both his personal story and connection to Mars Hill and the broader story of abusive and narcissistic leadership, its origins and incentives, and what happens when you found out that you've been plagiarized. We had been listened to the Mars Hill podcast had some familiarity with Mark's radio work. And we met pretty soon after we arrived, probably in the fall of 1998. There was a beginning discussion because we were Mars Hill graduate school, and he was just beginning to develop Mars Hill Church, that there might be some overlap, both a vision, but also the practicality of space. And so we early on met a few times to see if we could utilize space during the week that then would be available because we would not be using it on that Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday period. And that opened up a beginning conversation of, uh, you know, who is Mark Driscoll and what does he represent and who were those players uh, in the early Mars Hill graduate school. Yeah. What was your impression of him at the time? I mean, he became this larger-than-life character in a lot of ways later. And you mentioned the radio show. I mean, that's one of the things we really didn't cover in the podcast. But I just I just, I don't know. I, I mean, I know that this is not what the episode is about, but I just want you to hear that. So Mar, Mark Driscoll, who, what did you think about him? It becomes about Mark Driscoll, Mark Driscoll, the man, Mark Driscoll, Mark Driscoll, the personality, Mark Driscoll, Mark Driscoll, the character, All right? Just, just keep that in mind. Because I think this is very, 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 very vital to one of my issues here. And you'll, you'll see how this plays out. I'm assuming you're talking about the show he did with Leaf. Did he have that kind of bravado, you know, sitting across the table from him in 98? Oh, most definitely. And in fact, <laughs> the very first word uh, when I said, you know, Mark, I don't know you. You don't know me. How would you describe yourself? And his first word was pugilistic. And by both the means and the force in which he said it, it was clear that he saw himself as a brawler, as somebody who essentially was a bar fighter. And that's a a bit of my own background. I want you to just stay with me here, all right? Because we claim that community is where Christians come together because we have something in common, right? Okay, and, and I tell you, fellowship and community only takes place when we're there with the word of God open and we're preaching and teaching. But everyone thinks community is, some, community is something else, right? That it's, it's community is about, I don't know, it, it's this emotional thing. There's some kind of feeling. There's some kind of a, there's some kind of a, almost like a friendship kind of concept. But I, I want you to realize that in so many churches, the community, in many cases, is organized and almost becomes identified and almost begins to take on the characteristics of the thing it, in a sense, has in common that in many cases has nothing to do with Christ 
or nothing to do with Christianity. It becomes about something else. It becomes about a purpose. It becomes about a movement. It becomes about an agenda. It becomes about a personality. Let me, let me explain what I mean. Many churches, many churches, the community of that church is more identified. Maybe you'll get, have a group of people in that church who are very much known for their parental parenting philosophy. Maybe it'll be something about corporal punishment, something about how to punish a kid, how to raise a kid. Maybe the church will be known more for its idea of rejecting dating for courtship or, or, or purity culture, or, or we don't watch TV and we don't listen to rock and roll. Like it's known, like so much of community within Christianity is not defined by Christ. It's defined by all of these sex secondary issues, right? The women don't wear pants or the women, the the women don't cut their hair or the women don't wear lots of makeup. And and we only use the King James, whatever. It becomes about these secondary issues. And in this particular case, does Mars Hill, is it a community or is it a, and, and, and maybe it's defined as a community, but is it a community about Christ or is it a community that becomes identified by celebrity and identified by the character and attribute of said celebrity. Now we can condemn Mars Hill, but every church I think does the same. They become kind of, their community is about something other than Christ and they don't see it. They're known more for their, I don't know, pro gun stance, their politics, their, their, why that? And I've just seen churches where homeschooling, you know, whatever the case may be. And it's like, that's the community. That's what they have in common. It's the secondary issues. Not pugilism, but bar fighting, I guess they somewhat overlap. So there was a certain degree of sync with regard to both of us having moderately to significantly broken backgrounds coming into faith outside of what could be called the conservative church. So there was at least initially intrigue and openness, but let's just say within a fairly short period of time, it became clear that the vision, the purpose, and far more the sense of how we operate as human beings in the world, that joining space was not going to be a good choice. Yeah. It's remarkable to me. I mean, one of the aspects of it that made it such a powerful phenomenon, especially in that first decade, was that there was a real richness of community. Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay. So what made it so powerful at the beginning? There was a rich sense of community. There was a rich sense of community. Now that I, if I, I would, it'd be interesting to go through all the episodes of the rise and fall of Mars Hill podcast and see how many times community was mentioned. There was, we've lost internet. Well, I think we may still be live on church one. Okay. Well, all right. I, we're going to keep going, all right? All of a sudden, the internet came back. I don't know. Hopefully, we haven't lost anything. We're going to keep going, all right? We're going to keep going. But it would be, so I, I will re- rephrase. I saw. I apologize. I got every notification that we had lo- uh, lost our connection. I could edit this out, but I'll just leave it here because it will be real and it will be organic and true. So I'll just leave this here. All right, but let's continue. So it would be interesting to know how frequently that word community was used in the Rise and Fall Mar- Mars Hill podcast to describe Mars Hill. At the beginning, it had a sense of community, community, but did it? What? It's like that word is used all the time. I need true sense of community. What was the community? What, ro- really, what, ro- what really was the community at that time? What was it? Let's 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 carry this out, and then I can try to com- put this whole discussion together, and hopefully it will make sense. Friendship, you know, I'm sure this is something you've thought a lot about: is how does Christian community form? I mean, it's such a critical piece of spiritual transformation. Okay, how does Christian community form? It's such a critical part. Of transformation. Now, according to them, so how does it form? How does community form? And it's critical for spiritual transformation. It's critical, which once again gives the idea that you can't have spiritual transformation apart from community. 
and you don't have community, you don't have transformation. I, 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 I so struggle with this because I, I, I've only done it. I've done it maybe two times, but every time I've asked listeners, you email me and tell me what was the thing that tra- that was most influential in your spiritual growth and your spiritual development. What was the key thing? And very rarely do I hear the church. I hear so many other things, not the church. And if someone says the church, I'm like, well, exactly how, how, what, what was, what was the church doing? That's so dramatically led to your spiritual transformation. But it's, this is the, this is the thing we always say, you got it. Basically, this is the, the motto and it's been the motto for a while, but it, it still seems to be pretty dominant in 2022 is with it, the church. It's, I hate to say it. It's almost like a marketing tool, right? It's almost like, Hey guys, you're Christians. Well, guess what? You cannot live. You cannot succeed. You cannot be transformed without us. You need the church without us. You, so it almost is a way of marketing the church. It's almost a way of saying, this is why you support us, because you can't survive without us. Now, I am not in any way dismissing the church or trying to minimize the church. I just think that we have a way of, of trying to sell this that I, I sometimes question the validity of it. Without community, boom, you're just done. You can't, you can't be transformed. Really? I can't. Are you sure? The word of God's not sufficient. Preaching and teaching of God's word that's available. Now, yeah, now there was a time in church history where without the church, you, you didn't have access to the preaching and teaching. You didn't even have access to a Bible. You didn't, I mean, you went to the church to hear the word of God read. So it was a different time, but now we're in a different time. Now, I'm not saying church is not biblical. I'm not, I'm not minimizing it. What I'm trying to say is we sell it like you can't without us. Are you sure? It is community critical for transformation. Let's see what else they say. Emotional health, all the rest of it. How do you think about the idea that there is this pugilistic, dogmatic, you know, the rallying point is this personality that doesn't even seem to really like, certainly doesn't trust relationships as things go along. And yet the community is the thing more than anything else that people were citing to say, this is why we're here. But see, was it the community why they were there? Or was it the personality? Was it the community, quote unquote, or was the, was the, in other words, was the community about Christ or was the community about the personality? Was the community about the word of God, or was the community about something new, something fresh, something hip, something edgy? Was it a, was it about something, you know, a movement, a purpose? Was it about we're going to show these other churches the right way to do it? These other churches are dead and cold and old and archaic, and we're new and we're edgy. Was it because you were, was the community about Christ or was it about something else? I see, I think so much of what we say is community. It's, it's, it's just a facade. It's just, it's just the word we, it's just like the word fellowship. We, we place the word fellowship on us sitting around talking about the weather, shoving food down our throats. We put the word community on any group of people gathered together, but are they gathered together for anything truly spiritual or just because, well, they want friends and they like to hang out with people and they want to make really, I mean, it's like, it's nothing more than getting together with lost people and making friends. Is community about friendship? Is it about relationships or is it about the word of God? Communities are built on common values, uh, which is another way of saying core commitments. In terms of scripture, in terms of understanding uh, death, resurrection, ascension, core doctrine. So I think... See, and that's the thing. Community is centered around Core doctrine, the word of God. Community means a group of people who come together, who believe similar doctrine, and who are gathered together for the preaching and teaching of God's word. But see, so many people are like, okay, well, we can't, 
We, no, we need more than that. I mean, you always hear Christians say this. Well, I mean, and you can't just do that in the sanctuary. That's not really community. So then they, by, in a very subtle way, they've changed community to us coming together to have the word of God in common to we've got to break off in smaller groups because we need to develop interpersonal relationships and we need to get to know each other. I think you just subtly just turned community into something far more fleshly, human, secular than sacred. You say, are you saying relationships are bad? I'm not saying that. I'm saying that Christian fellowship and Christian community has to be something different than the average thing that happens in the world every Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Lost people get together. They make friends. They develop, People from work get together. They go to Chili's. They go here. They go wh- wherever the case may be. They go to wh- whatever activity they're doing. When, when our, our concept of fellowship and community is just copying the world's concept, and then we, we, but we throw a spiritual tag on it, I, 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 don't, I don't get that. I don't get that. And, and that's why in many cases when they start the small groups, the small groups become far more about friendships and relationships than it does the word of God. That's why the teaching in some small groups is so shallow. It's such a waste of time because they're more there for the snacks and the, the relationship. So then why call it why call it small group or community group? Just call, hey, on Thursdays, Hey guys, come over to my house. We'll just hang out. Why? And if you get to the Bible, great. If you don't, you don't. Don't call it a church activity. Don't make it something more spiritual than it is. You want to get together and hang out with some people. That's okay. Do so. It's perfectly okay. Just don't pretend that it's something other than what it is. I think there was such a... This is a vital believing world. Now, there are reasons to be together and that sense of service of we are transforming this dark, godless community and individual lives. So between those two realms of... See, we're, we're, see, community becomes, see, we're a part of a purpose. We're transforming this godless society. Are we, did you, did you really, did you transform Seattle? Did you really, I mean, and, and again, when, when community becomes about the, the purpose instead of the person, Christ, when it becomes about an agenda and not the worship of Christ, then I think community becomes something other than we pretend we we call it community when it's not true biblical community. We call it fellowship when it's not true biblical fellowship. Solid perceptive doctrine, then deep, deep, deep sense of purpose. You had another factor that often is not there, even in you know, like current realms of evangelicalism, and that's a level of honesty. And Mark was honest about being pugilistic. He was honest about, in some ways, being a bully. And in that level of ownership of his own humanity, I think he drew, at least initially, a lot of people who were like, finally, someone is telling the truth about how messed up we were and how still the reality of our own brokenness may be showing itself. Now, I would say, though I'm not a student of Mark Driscoll, I would say that changed by about 2002 to 2004. And there was a shifting into a level of his power and the place within America, uh, let alone Seattle, began to grow in such proportion that that same level of humility, at least at some level, was uh, not the primary draw. Now, though we had a number of discussions over what I would call from 98 to probably around 2006, again, not frequent by any means, a handful of discussions, but with me at least, he was quite honest about uh, his struggles with his father, with his relationship and his family. Uh, And in some ways, the uh, 
intensity of his pugilism made a whole lot of sense, given the nature of some of the trauma that he would own to some degree. So, you know, when you look at trauma as a lens, you're looking at three factors, almost inevitably, some degree of fragmentation, because the nature of trauma shuts down our left hemisphere, particularly our left frontal lobe in the moment, but also in some sense, long term. So what you have when you've got significant past trauma is a history of fragmentation, which really bright, gifted people overcome by, in some sense, accentuating something of the left hemisphere. And he was well-read, brilliant. Having not been to seminary, I was and graduated from a fine seminary. I mean, he was better read on many levels than I was. So we had some really fascinating, good discussions about the Reformed faith, where we agreed, differed, et cetera. Again, these are the early years. And in that conversation, I had great respect for his level of education. But what I would go back to is so often what seems to happen with fragmentation it is that it gets covered over by a form of dogmatism. You know, the more certain you become, the less fragmented you feel. And that lack of capacity, because the very nature of reflection on any matter where there are different views means that you're in the middle of some level of fragmentation. And in that, when it triggers a person historically from their own past trauma, you can see why so often particularly communities that invite very traumatized people. And Mark's community, Marcel Church, offered highly traumatized people a place where they could be at rest. And oftentimes, I want you to hear that. Traumatized people. So was the community com together because of common trauma or because of common doctrine and common in Christ. Now, is there a pro problem having community about common trauma? I'm not saying that. Is that biblical community? Is that, is that biblical fellowship? So no, no, what I'm trying to demonstrate here is that we, we call things fellowship that by no, does not mean fellowship in any meaningful biblical way. We, we refer to things as community that I think in many cases has nothing to do with the biblical concept. And what we, and so it's so easy to then say, oh, we're in community, but we're not in really biblical community. We're in a, we're in a, we're basically in a secular community where we are in, what we have in common is something secondary to actually Christ and, and the entire word of God. It's some secondary thing. We call it fellowship when we're just sitting at a table shoving food down our throat when really it's not fellowship. But then at the same time, we'll turn around and say, if you don't have these two things, you can't grow as a Christian and that your whole spirit, you cannot be transformed and everything is broken. And I, that's where I call a lot of this into question. Now, I'm just going to leave it there. All right. I've tried to explain myself, but that's OK. I, I, I haven't explained myself maybe to the level of clarity on purpose because I want it to spark conversation and discussion. You may strongly disagree with me, and you can email me at newsif at yahoo.com. Newsif at yahoo.com. Now, we did lose internet connection for a minute. I don't really know at what point we lost internet connection. What I probably should have done is when we, we came back on is back up the audio just a little bit. Um, I will go back and see if we missed anything. If we did, I apologize, but I have no control over that. I don't know what happened, um, but... It, it came back on, so at least we didn't lose everything. Hopefully, this conversation will be of some value. I know it's going to be basically rejected by the majority, and that's okay. I've always been on the outside on this topic. I've always been on the outside, and I understand why people disagree with me. It goes against so much of – it's just – I just think that you enter into Christianity and you're just given these words, fellowship and community. I know whenever challenges anyone on their use of these terminology – uh, on this terminology. And this episode of The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill, even though it's not really about community, the word was mentioned multiple times, but in a roundabout way, I think they're demonstrating that the so-called community at Mars Hill was probably not biblical community. It was built on something other than that. 
And that is the problem. When you can be deceived and deluded and thinking you want community when all you really want is something completely other than biblical community. You just want friends. You just want interaction with other people. You just want to hang out and talk about the weather and whatever things you like, your hobbies, your interest. That's what you want. Well, that's great. You don't need to call that anything Christian. You don't need to call anything. You don't need to be connected to the church. It doesn't need to be the cancellation of church services for you to go hang out with friends and have a burger and talk about the weather. Don't refer to that as something spiritual. Just acknowledge what it is. It's the same thing your lost friends do. And that's perfectly okay. Human beings long, for most case, most human beings long, need, crave that intimacy of friends and sitting around talking about the weather. That to them is like, that's life. Okay, well, wonderful, great. Just don't act like that that somehow makes you more spiritual and that if people don't do that, then their spirituality doesn't exist. That's just such garbage that people put that on everyone. Fellowship and community is when we come together around the word of God for the preaching, teaching, worship, praise, prayer, and the ordinances. Don't have to turn it into something else when in reality, you you know why you want the other thing? Because the preaching and teaching and the, the basic church structure, you want something different. You want something more. And then we, we're going to give it a spiritual name so that we feel spiritually justified and pursuing what may not be anything more than a fleshly desire. And you can't just acknowledge that. I, I see, I have the respect for, I have respect for the people going, look, man, I just want to hang out on Friday night with some friends. Okay, man, got no problem with that. You don't need the church. Don't need me. Don't need the church to facilitate it, organize it, and then pretend that it's something other than what it is. All right. This won't be popular, but that's okay. Newsif at yahoo.com. Newsif at yahoo.com. There's going to be much misunderstanding that arises from this discussion, but that's okay. All right. Uh, that was what you heard was a little bit of the rise and fall of Mars Hill, the new episode that just dropped a few hours ago. It's not about what I, 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 I'm using it to talk about community. Just I just find it hilarious for them to use the word community, talk about how absolutely essential community is and not realize and then refer to community sometimes as Mars Hill. And I just think maybe community there was never the community that it was supposed to be from a biblical perspective. But I, I guess you can't raise that question because you go after the buzzword that everyone's supposed to use is community, 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 community. All right. There we go. Thanks for listening. Everyone have a great day. God bless.